Hello, I'm Matt Galloway, and this is The Current Podcast. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot. The only home we've ever known. That's the late astronomer Carl Sagan. And that distant pale blue dot is, of course, us, Earth. That image was captured, at Sagan's suggestion, by Voyager 1, when it was 6 billion kilometers from Earth. The space probe began its journey on the 5th of September, 1977. Over the next four and a half decades, it would travel 24 billion kilometers. In November of last year, Voyager 1 went dark. This week, though, engineers at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory fixed the problem. Voyager put out a tweet. Hello, it's me. The Canadian astronaut Chris Hatfield is with me to talk about this. He's in Toronto. Chris, good morning. Good morning, Matt. I remember when this thing launched, and I remember all of the talk about where it was going and what it might do. How would you describe Voyager 1 and and, and its significance? Uh, it is... The, the thing that humans have built that has the, gone the furthest from the Earth, it is, it is our furthest reach out into the unknown. And even back in 77 uh, when it was launched, that's what it was set out to do, to, to go explore the things that we'd only just barely been able to see with our eyes, and then through the telescopes that we'd built since Galileo looked in the early 1600s. So it was, it was like our first great emissary to go and have a look at the distant reaches of the unknown. And it's still, amazing enough, almost 47 years later, continuing to, to do that. 24 billion kilometers. Where is that? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, if, if you uh, step out of the front door of your house, you know, you, you, at every you cross various borders, right? As you go further and further, you know, your whatever your street or your neighborhood or your subway mm -hmm. stop or your town or your province or your country. If you keep going, then uh, eventually you get, you know, out, out beyond the atmosphere, and then you get beyond the orbit of the Earth, and you go by other planets, and then you get further than the furthest planet, and then you get like beyond even the effect of our sun, or or at least where our sun is put, creating sort of this this wake through the universe, and, and so the the numbers are so huge that it's almost um, unimaginable just how far away. Voyager is. But the fact that it keeps sending us these little bursts of, of new information, it's a reminder of, of what we're capable of, but also of just how big everything else is. We played a little bit of Carl Sagan talking about the pale blue dot. Um, and he says, that's here, that's home, that's us, this tiny little speck. When you look at that image, um, what do you see? I see reality. I see a perspective that everybody needs. Um, we get so hung up over our magnified interpersonal differences. Uh, and we forget, you know, it, it's like two toddlers uh, squawking over a toy. And, and we forget uh, who we actually are and where we actually are. And it, that doesn't mean the two toddlers aren't genuinely angry, or maybe there was a real issue with their toy, but you need to put it into perspective and think about the rarity the almost unfathomably beautiful nature of this little home where we live. And now I've left it for half a year. You know, I, I, I take some issue with what Carl Sagan, the only home we've ever known. I lived off this blue ball for <laughs> half a year. You're uh, rare but, in that, in that uh, accomplishment, yeah. but continue. But um, I, I really think it's important uh, for us to take care of, of each other and the day-to-day -day and recognize the incredible luck and uniqueness of the fact that we're alive on this little Eden of a place and um, that we're the most intelligent life that we have any record of ever existing and therefore think about our level of responsibility that comes with that to, to this home that we know. So Voyager is out there, 24 billion kilometers from us, and it goes dark. And there's some concern that perhaps it's not going to be able to communicate with us. It's sending gibberish back. And then somehow they fix it? They, how do you go about fixing a spacecraft that, that that's that far away? Yeah, well, they would send a signal to it. And it would send a signal back. But yeah, it was like ones and zeros, but not not in, in the order to, to, 
turn the binary into some sort of logic. It was just sort of, it had become uh, dumb or stupid for some reason. And amazingly enough, those brilliant engineers down at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and think about it, this is this is literally their grandfather's spaceship, you know, although a couple of them have been there since the start. Mm. But for a lot of them, 1977 was, you know, a decade or more before they were born. Um they figured it out. They, the ancient early computer code, a lot of Fortran, uh, and they they puzzled it through. They realized, you know, the only logical thing that could be causing this is if this little chip failed, one of the little processing chips. And let's try and figure out some code or talk to a piece of it that will bypass that chip, and then we'll just move memory and and uh, actionable programs somewhere else uh, on its very limited memory. And and incredibly. Those, those folks, a mixture of, of uh, veterans and new folks uh, and just regular looking folks, they, they put that together, solved it, and, and they got uh, regular information back from Voyager. And, you know, when we send a signal to Voyager, at the speed of light, mm. it takes almost a whole day just to get – so you get, hello, Voyager, it takes 22 and a half hours – for that to get to that great big antenna on Voyager, and then Voyager goes, oh, Earth said hello. I'll say hello back. Hello, another 22 and a half hours at the speed of light. And that's the thing that we built, you know, and it's still out there tough as nails. It was only supposed to last five years. Here it is 47 years later, and uh, and it is out there in the space between the stars, in interstellar space. So to me, it, it's a magnificent human triumph, and it's also a great, little uh emissary of discovery how much do you think it has left just before i let you go how much do you think it has left to tell us well it's powered by the these tiny little pellets of uh of um, radioactive material plutonium 238 that gives it just enough heat when it was brand new it had all the power of four light bulbs that was it that was the amount of power that it was generating just to, but just enough to keep the instruments going but over time uh, there, there's like an 80, whatever, 85 year, 83 year half life on that on that radioactive material. But also the wiring gets a little old, you know, and, and gets a little bit rickety and that's happening. So it's been losing power. By our best guess, it's definitely going to work uh, for a few more years and it might work for as much as, as another decade or more. Um, so it, it's just a triumph. It, it's like, uh, I don't know, a pyramid or, or some some great thing that almost uh, exceeds everybody's expectations. It's like a story of ambition in some way. And, last. and success, yeah. bo- both together, which which is the real mark of, of our species. Chris, I'm really glad to talk to you about this. Um, thank you very much. Nice to chat with you, Matt. Chris Hatfield is a Canadian astronaut. His most recent book is the novel, The Defector.